Okay, yeah, thank you. And thanks to the organizers for entertaining me and to you and coming and listening to me. So I'm going to describe uh, basically three works which are all on the archive. So I realize that three is probably three times too long for a talk, but I'm going to go on anyway. And when my 30 minutes are up, I'm going to stop. That's the plan. Okay, so you guys have heard a lot about twisted bilayer graphene. So I'm going to completely skip twisted bilayer graphene and I'm going to talk about things that are other than twisted bilayer graphene, but still within this very interesting uh, field of twisting various things. Okay, so the first work that I want to describe is this work that's, that's written up in this archive paper. And this is a sort of simple but interesting extension of physics that is related to the magic angle in graphene. So let's come back to the magic angle in graphene. And let's ask, why is it that you get a flat band in the case of, of this particular system? Uh, if you think about this, this is the band structure of twisted bilayer graphene. You have one Dirac cone, another Dirac cone, which are separated from each other by the twist angle. And when you put these two on top of each other, then at this particular point, there is a hybridization when electrons can hop between one side to the other. And uh, this hybridization is going to open up a gap and uh, if you also take into account the fact that electrons can tunnel between the layers, then you get the famous uh, flat band dispersion that is predicted in this work. Now, if you go and read uh, another of, of Alan McDonald's papers, uh, he makes the point, which is a very simple point, which is this particular uh, flat band business in the case of graphene is a special circumstance that happens because you have the Dirac dispersion on the one hand, and the hopping of the right amplitude on the other hand. But he said, imagine you take a much simpler system, for example, take one band of a semiconductor, this let's say is the valence band of a semiconductor, and you do the exact same thing, you make a Moray pattern, you put one layer on top of the other, and uh, you work out what happens in this case, then once again at this crossing point, you'll have some hybridization between the two layers, and uh, you will produce uh, a band which will also be generically flat uh, because for a semiconductor, this band is massive, uh, unlike a massless band in the case of graphene. So the prediction uh, from McDonald's group uh, was that you take any old semiconductor, take a twisted bilayer, and you should produce somewhat flat bands in a manner that's similar to twisted bilayer graphene. And I should mention that I've enjoyed very much reading recent work from Manish Jain's group here at IASC, lots of nice work on this topic. Okay, so the material of choice for our experiments are these famous transition metal dichalcogenides, which, is, uh, which are materials that are very similar to graphene. Uh, basically, if you look at them from the top, they look like uh, a graphene sheet, uh, except one of these atoms is a metal atom and the other atom is a calcogen atom. And these materials in the monolayer form are semiconductors with a large band gap uh, between 1 and 2 EV, depending upon the particular choice of material. Now, one of the important parts of the physics of these materials is that if you look in particular at the valence band of these materials, uh, the valence band here, this is at one particular K point of the band structure, uh, there's a large spin orbit splitting, uh, which means that at one particular K point, you have electrons only of one spin, and at the opposing K point, you have electrons only of the other spin. So let's take one of these materials and let's now put it on top of another material with a twist and let's see what one expects generically. So here is a band structure of one of these TMD materials. Uh, these are the 6K points. Uh, around the 6K points, uh, these are the, the valence bands if I'm sitting slightly below the, the top of the valence band. And uh, as I said, for one of these K points, I have spin of one color and for the other K point, I have spin of the opposite color. Now what we do is we take, uh, we do the, the usual business of taking a second of these layers, putting them on top of each other, twisting them by some small angle, and then looking and seeing what is the emergent band structure that, that arises from this system. And uh, so here's, here's a picture. This is in real space, there's a Moray pattern. This is in K space, you now have band folding, and this is a reduced Brillouin zone where uh, I now have my new band structure. And for uh, the experts, 
we study a system that's near AA stacking, that's a small angle theta and not a small angle 60 minus theta. Okay, so if you do this and you do simple theory, simple meaning DFT the theory, um, here is what you expect for the band structure. So if you look at this solid curve, the solid curve you should think of as the valence band of one of the layers, and this dashed curve is the valence band of the second layer. And when the electrons can hybridize, then you open up a hybridization gap at this endpoint of the band structure. And what you produce is one somewhat flat band. So if you look at this scale, this scale is 200 millivolts, so much larger than the case of twisted graphene. Uh, so the full bandwidth of this band is on the order of 50 to 100 millivolts. And once again, this is a cut of the band structure along this particular cut this way. So what we do is we do exactly the same thing that you do for graphene with a few notable differences. So the material of choice for us is uh, tungsten diselenide, which is the cleanest of these materials that we can make. Uh, in order to make electrical contact to these materials, it turns out to be quite tricky. Uh, we use chromium and platinum pre-patterned contacts in order to do this. And uh, we have a top gate and a bottom gate. So I should give you a little bit of an interlude. So one might think that this is a very obvious experiment to try. And there's a good reason why it hasn't worked for many people in the past. And that's because these materials intrinsically are not as good as graphene. <coughs> So if you go to the store, the store meaning a few companies which sell these kinds of materials, and you buy a material, let's say tungsten diselenide, and uh, you look at the defects in this material, so this is with STM, you will basically find defects that are roughly 10,000 to 100,000 times more than graphene. And we spent a good couple of years reducing the defect density from what you get in a commercial sample. Uh, we sort of used our own crystals to improve the concentration of defects to a point where we can get to the intrinsic physics of these systems. Okay, so I'm jumping straight into the data. This is transport data taken on a number of samples. And what these different samples are different twist angles between the two layers. So the first sample I want you to see is this black curve. And this black curve corresponds to the resistance, longitudinal resistance as a function of filling uh, for a Bernal stacked bilayer of a, of a twisted TMD. So if you look at the Bernal stacking, what you see is here is high resistance, and this is the valence band edge. So right near the valence band edge, you have a bunch of states that are localized, and these don't give you good transport, and so you have a high resistance. But once you cross this threshold, once you turn the device on, uh, the material becomes a metal because you're doping into the valence band, and as you dope further and further into the valence band, it becomes a better and better conductor. And so you see this black curve just keeps going and, and the resistance is low. Now in contrast to that, if you look at the data for all of these twisted samples, what you see is first you see the onset of conduction right here, and then you keep going and then you see a nice peak in the resistance, which indicates that there's some interesting state there. And uh, for each of these angles, so these are different angles going from four to five degrees, you see that this peak occurs at a different density. And uh, essentially that's because the size of the Moray pattern is changing as a function of angle. And as the size of the Moray pattern changes, the number of electrons that you need to fill the Moray pattern also change. Now, what we can do is we can apply a large magnetic field and when we apply a large magnetic field, we can see magnetotransport at high field. We can see the Landau levels. And from looking at uh, what happens to these Landau levels, we can nail down very precisely where this point of high resistance happens as a function of filling of the Moray cell. And what we find is exactly like the case of twisted bilayer graphene, is that this peak in the resistance occurs exactly at one half uh, filling of the Moray unit cell. Now, one very big difference uh, between this system and the case of twisted bilayer graphene is that uh, twisted bilayer graphene has an additional degeneracy of two because of the spin degeneracy, which this system doesn't have. We can also look in the vicinity of this half-filling point. 
Um, so once again, this half-filling point, exactly like in twisted bilayer graphene, is a point where you don't expect, according to simple band theory, uh, there to be any insulating behavior. But if you look exactly at this half-filling that corresponds to this black curve, you see that the resistance first goes down. So this looks like metallic behavior. There's a very nice uh, uh, metal to insulator transition, and then it becomes insulating. Um, but if you go to a doping that's away from this region, this red region, let's say you go somewhere here and you measure the resistance as a function of temperature, you find that it continues to remain a metal all the way down to zero temperature. So here uh, we can see that there's, as a function of doping, that there's a nice metal insulator transition that you can, you can have in this. Um, but there's also more. Um, what we can do, exactly like what Mandar talked about earlier, is we can apply an electric field between the layers. And when you apply an electric field between the layers, then you, you, you change the on-site energies of electrons on the two layers. And we find that the effect of that also is to drive a metal to insulator transition. So in this particular diagram, a line that goes along the direction of the laser pointer is a direction, is, is a line that corresponds to changing electric field, but always sitting at half filling. And these are particular cuts taken exactly uh, at half filling for different values of the electric field. Um, you see that there's a bunch of curves in here in this red region where you have insulating behavior. So as you lower the temperature, the resistance gets higher. But if you look in this region, which corresponds to this region, then the resistance decreases as you lower the temperature. So you have a metallic state. So once again here, you have a metal to insulator transition, here driven by electric field and not driven by doping. And uh, one of the very interesting things of this is you can look at the activated behavior of gaps on the, on the insulating side, and you can plot out what these gaps do as a function of electric field. It has this nice dome-like behavior. And uh, on either side where there's a metal to insulator transition, we see that this gap continuously goes to zero, at least within transport. So this is perhaps some evidence that this transition is actually second order, uh, which would be quite rare and interesting. Uh, because typically, if you have, for example, a mod transition, you also have some lattice distortion, which messes up a lot of interesting physics that might happen exactly at this boundary. So we are hoping that this is indeed a second order transition, and we can study this boundary region more carefully. This is at fixed density, all at half filling. So you're sitting exactly at half filling and you're tuning the electric field, and as a function of electric field, you see a metal to insulator run. Okay, so we can ask what is it that we can identify within theory that controls where this metal to insulator transition happens? Um, and so we go back to our theorists and uh, ask them to do DFT calculations at different values of this electric field, and shown here are results for a few different electric fields. Again, these are all within single particle theory. And uh, you see that as you go from zero electric field to a small electric field, uh, you see that the valence band of one layer and the valence band of the other layer are no longer degenerate with each other. So you, 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 you split them away from each other. And what this does, if you look at the density of states of the top Moray band, which is where all this physics happens, this is what the density of states of the top Moray band does as a function of electric field. So exactly at zero electric field, there's a Van Hove singularity, which is somewhere close to the half filled point. But as you start to apply electric field, this Van Hove singularity starts to run away from the half filling point and eventually goes far away deep into the band. Now we can correlate what theory says for different electric fields to, uh, oh, I should say one thing before I go there. We can also experimentally measure where this Van Hove singularity is uh, from our transport measurements. So if we look at the Hall effect, then the Hall effect has a change of sign uh, at this, at this Lifshitz transition. And so at different values of this electric field, we can pinpoint where that sign change happens in the Hall effect. And so we can track and essentially tracks theory reasonably well for, for what's expected. So putting this all together, what we can say is that the insulating state that we see persists up to a range of electric fields where the Van Hove singularity, so these dots are the positions of the Van Hove singularity, as long as the Van Hove singularity is somewhere close to half filling, we see this insulating behavior. 
once this Van Hove singularity starts to run very far from half filling, then we lose this insulating behavior. So it's a picture of, of if you wish, moderate correlations, where um, uh, the state on the one hand is fixed exactly at half filling, so it's like a Mott insulator. But on the other hand, it does care about the density of states in the system. And when the density of states at half filling becomes sufficiently small, then you have a metal to insulator transition. Yes. 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 So there's there's a few different theories for what kind of uh, insulating state can emerge in this particular state in this particular situation. So Liang Fu, for example, has a theory that it's a, more like an excitonic insulator. Um, possibly, we don't know. Liang Fu's theory has a broken symmetry, but we don't have any evidence for that. <coughs> And uh, finally, just to, to round this off, this story, um, if you dope away from half filling, we do see regions where the resistance goes all the way to zero, and TC is on the order of three Kelvin. I should say that these superconducting states tend to be fragile. So we've had about three or four samples which all have similar TCs, but if you uh, cycle them five times, then very often the device would go bad. So this is something that we are still trying to improve. Uh, but certainly there do seem to be regions where the resistance goes to zero. Um, good. So that is all I had to say about this system. If you want to read more about this, uh, it's in this work. So I'm going to jump quickly now to uh, my second topic, which is described in this particular work. And uh, in this work, we ask the question, um, can you have interesting correlated states in these kinds of systems without the use of a Moray pattern? So let's think about what the Moray pattern is doing for us. The Moray pattern is doing two things. One is it's adding a spatial periodicity. Here, this is the periodicity associated with a twist angle. And uh, the Moray pattern is also responsible for creating these flat bands where there's a large density of states. And so we wanted to ask the question, if you can just create the large density of states without necessarily having a Moray pattern, would you see interesting uh, correlated states in such a system? And uh, so let's first ask, if you take, for example, twisted bilayer graphene, how many real electrons are sitting in this particular flat band? So here is a picture of the flat band that you typically see. This is in the reduced Brillouin zone uh, uh, of the material. But uh, a useful way, at least for me, to think about the system is to think in the unfolded zone and think about what the band structure looks like. So this is the spectrum of monolayer graphene. And of course, the, the Van Hove singularity for monolayer graphene is, is all the way down here at 1 eV. And so if I look in the unfolded zone, then the states that are participating in the flat band are only a small sliver of the entire Brillouin zone. They're less than 1% of the Brillouin zone. And uh, so that's, that's on the order of 10 to the 13 electrons per square centimeter, for those of you keeping count. So the question is, how can you put 10 to the 13 electrons per square centimeter without using a Moray pattern? And uh, like everything else in this field, McDonald has given us a prescription. Um, and McDonald, in this uh, beautiful paper, did something which even I can do, which is to do a tight binding calculation for different kinds of stackings of graphene. So AB graphene, ABA graphene, ABC graphene, and so on and so forth. And the beautiful result is if you take ABC graphene uh, of, of N layers, then the band structure within sort of nearest neighbor tight binding looks, lo looks like the following. The energy goes as momentum to the nth power where N is the number of layers. So, so n equals 1 is, is monolayer graphene, n equals 2 is bilayer graphene, and so on and so forth. So in this very simple theory, if you go to n equals 50, then you have a, a dispersion that's extremely flat, and so the density of states is going to be enormous at charge neutrality in the system. Right? So uh, if you do a more realistic calculation, also done by McDonald, then... Um, you find that within about 10 millivolts of the Fermi level, which is a relevant energy scale in the case of twisted bilayer graphene, that if you look at ABC graphene, 
ABC graphene has roughly the same number of electrons within 10 millivolts of the Fermi level as uh, twisted bilayer graphene. And if you go to ABCA graphene, it has five times as many electrons as ABC. And if you go to ABCAB, it stays more or less the same, and so on and so forth. So it looked to us that a sweet spot is looking at ABCA graphene is a way of getting a large density of states at the chemical potential. There's only one problem. Making graphene that's rhombohedral like this is, is a pain in the butt. And that's because graphene wants to be ABAB, Bernal stacked. And if you make ABCA, it doesn't take very much at all for it to transform back into ABAB. And so we discovered, or rather my student discovered, a very cute way of making ABCA graphene. And let me explain this to you. Um, so let's first go to twisted bilayer graphene. So here is what twisted bilayer graphene looks like in real space. Here is one honeycomb lattice. Here is the other honeycomb lattice. And AA stacking corresponds to where one honeycomb is sitting directly on top of the other honeycomb. Now this is the Moray pattern that is formed when you have a small twist angle between uh, the two layers. And uh, you can see what happens as you go from here to here is you slide the lattice by, by one lattice constant in that direction, you get to AB graphene. If you go in this direction, you slide the lattice constant in the other direction, and you get BA graphene. And so here you have AB graphene, here you have BA graphene. And so as you go around in a wheel, you have AB, BA, AB, BA, AB, BA, with AA regions right in between. Now, and in fact, if you go to small twist angles, so this is a very small twist angle, what the system prefers to do is to maximize these regions of AB and BA stacking. So here this is AB and BA stacking. These are the AA regions and so on. Now let's play the same game, but let's play it with twisted double bilayer, not twisted bilayer. So here is A bilayer, AB bilayer, and I'm going to cut it in two, and I'm going to stack the two on top of each other with a small twist angle. Now, this corresponds to the AA region of twisted bilayer graphene. But in the case of twisted double bilayer graphene, if I just add the second layer on top, you see that what you get in the case of twisted double bilayer graphene is BAAC, a quite different and interesting stacking orientation. And further, if you shift the lattice constant by one on one side, you get ABAB, or Bernal graphene. But if you shift it by one on the other side, you actually get rhombohedral graphene. You get ABCA graphene. And so what this says is that if I take uh, a sheet of small twist angle double bilayer graphene, then the regions that are formed are, have re big regions of Bernal graphene and rhombohedral graphene. And so these two sites are inequivalent with each other. And uh, if you didn't get this, don't worry. I didn't get this. My student tried to explain to me. We fought for a long time. I called him an idiot. But then I realized he was right. So this should be different from this in the case of twisted double bilayer graphene. And I should say, this is just a very short interlude. This is now twisted double bilayer graphene near the magic angle. And uh, the fact that these two sites are different, actually, I believe, is something that's not really been thought about very much theoretically. If you look at the wave functions in twisted double bilayer graphene, they are significantly different from the wave functions of twisted bilayer graphene in that these two regions are inequivalent with each other. And so they have all kinds of beautiful physics associated with that. But anyway, I don't want to get into that particular point. What I want to do is I want to look at very small angle twisted double bilayer graphene, where now this region corresponds to Bernal stacking, and this region corresponds to rhombohedral stacking of the graphene. And uh, we can go in with So this is an STM topograph. And you can just see uh, the contrast here. Uh, one of the interesting things is Bernal is the more preferred orientation. So you can see there's a little bit of a bow in this thing, right? And that's Bernal wanting to maximize its, its area and wanting to kill the rhombohedral. So you can tell which is which from. But the easier thing to do in STM is to just look at the spectrum. And if you look at the spectrum, there's an amazing difference between these two regions. So if I sit on this black region, that's a spectrum of AB, AB, Bernal graphene. And if I sit here on these pink regions, that's a spectrum of beautiful flat band for ABAB rhombohedral graphene. 
And this is uniform, so it looks kind of messy here, but if I look at the density of states at this peak, it's beautifully uniform in the entire region. Okay, now, in this system, the electric field, just like bilayer graphene, has a, a beautiful effect. In the case of bilayer graphene, uh, the low energy physics is dominated by these two orbitals on the A and B sides of the two layers. And if you apply an electric field, these two are, are displaced from each other, and so you open up a gap. And this effect is even more pronounced in the case of ABCA graphene. Now the low energy physics is dominated by the orbital A orbital on the lowermost uh, sheet and the B orbital on the, on the uppermost sheet. And so when I apply an electric field, once again, I will create a gap in the system. And uh, indeed, we can see this in our STM spectroscopy. So when you apply a gate voltage in the STM experiment, the gate voltage also unavoidably adds an electric field because the STM tip uh, is maintained roughly at the same potential as the sample. And so as we apply a gate voltage, we also apply an electric field, and uh, we can see how big of a gap we open in the spectrum. We can compare it to single particle theory, and for large values of the doping or the electric field, uh, the, the experiment and single particle theory agree remarkably well. So this is sort of large values of, of uh, electric field. But however, when we come down to small values of the electric field, so near charge neutrality of the system, what we find is that there is a fairly substantial gap that remains in the spectrum, uh, even though there is no electric field. And so this effect, this intrinsic gap in the system is once again a correlated gap. It's a many body gap in the system. Uh, we've done some theory on what this insulating state is. It turns out that the two leading candidates in mean field theory, uh, one is a, an excitonic insulator, this one, and the other one is a, a, a ferry magnet of this type. And since I'm running fairly short on time, I'm going to skip over a couple of things about this. I'll just say that in this system, there is yet another beautiful aspect of this interface between rhombohedral and Bernal graphene, which you can see when you look at this local density of states image movie. So this is a, these, these are movies of what the wave functions look like at different energies. And I want you to focus on one particular energy right there where you see beautiful states that are at the boundary between the ABAB and ABCA graphene. So right there, at this particular energy, you see beautiful edge states that are between the ABAB and ABCA region. And it turns out that ABCA and ABAB have different value churn numbers. ABCA has a value churn number of two, ABAB has a value churn number of one, and uh, that difference gives rise to uh, an edge mode at these boundaries. Okay, in the last two minutes, I'm going to talk about something that's purely experimental, uh, but something that's been very entertaining for us in the last few months. And uh, that's the following. In this entire business of Moray patterns, one of the big problems has been that the samples you make, nobody knows what this Moray pattern looks like unless you do either something like STM, which is time and, and labor intensive, not always works. Uh, other techniques, for example, this is nano optics. You can see Moray patterns, but only if they're large enough. The optical wavelength is, is, is large. So we wanted a method by which we can see Moray patterns. This is n -som using IR, yeah. But the limit to this is about 10 or 20 nanometers which is limited to the radius of the tip. So uh, we developed, or we didn't develop, this method is well known in the ferroelectric community. What we found is that Moray patterns actually have a beautiful piezoelectric response. So the way this measurement works is the following. You do regular AFM, uh, but while doing regular AFM, you apply an electric field, um, an AC electric field, and you monitor the torsion of the cantilever. So the cantilever can do either this, which is tapping, or the cantilever can do this, which is torsion. And if you monitor the torsion of the cantilever, you'll see whether the sample displaces under the effect of the electric field, which would be a piezoelectric effect. And we found that all of these Moray patterns display a beautiful piezoelectric response when you probe them um, uh, in this fashion. 
And uh, we can go a little bit further. We can actually uh, look carefully and see where the displacement of the sample is for a given electric field. And I'll cut this story short. And what I'll say is if you apply an out of plane electric field, it turns out that the, uh, the sample displaces along the domain wall. So it's an off diagonal component of the piezoelectric tensor that's responsible. Now this technique is great because you can just stick in a sample. This is an eight micron scan. You can see whatever you want. This is a very inhomogeneous Moray pattern. Uh, it works for absolutely anything. This is single layer graphene on hexagonal boron nitride. This is twisted WSE2. This is twisted boron nitride. This is WSE2 and MOSE2. For example, in this case, the resolution is sub five nanometers. And uh, so this has sort of become absolutely a standard just as a, as a characterization tool. Those of you who don't use it, uh, you should. Now, we became also interested in asking why is there a piezoelectric response in these materials? After all, graphene by itself has inversion symmetry, so it doesn't have a piezoelectric response. And uh, the answer turns out to be something called the flexoelectric effect, which I have a little cartoon for right here. So imagine I take any old crystal with ionic crystal, and uh, if I apply uniform strain to this ionic crystal, then I don't generate a dipole if there's inversion symmetry. But if I apply a non-uniform strain, a strain gradient, then I can generate a dipole in the material. And so this effect called the flexoelectric effect is always present, but usually it's always swamped by the leading order term, which is the piezoelectric term. And these materials are beautiful cases where the piezoelectric term by symmetry is absolutely zero, but the flexoelectric term is non-zero exactly at these domain boundaries. And OK, I'm going to skip over a bunch of this theory since I'm already out of time. Uh, so what the net conclusion of all of this is that all of these twisted materials actually have dipoles in them. Um, and uh, this is something that actually people haven't considered what the effect of these dipoles is on the low energy physics, as far as I know. And so this is something I think quite worth investigating. OK, so before I end, I should uh, mention the people who did the work. These are people from my group. I especially mention Alex Kerelsky, who is now graduated. Augusto did the twisted WSC2 work. And Leo was the one who invented this PFM technique in, in, in my lab. Uh, we, our theory collaborators, main collaborator is Angel Rubio's group from the Max Planck at Hamburg. And Lede, who is now moving to the Institute of Physics in, in China, and Dante. Uh, we had theory support from Cyrus Dreyer, who's at Stony Brook, and some experts in flexoelectricity. The Twisted WSC2 is a collaboration with uh, Corey Dean. Um, in fact, most of this work is collaborations between Corey Dean and Jim Hohn. And Daniel Rhodes is the one who grew those nice samples, who's now moving to Wisconsin. Uh, the nano optics, which I didn't show you much of, is done with uh, Dmitry Basov and Xiaoyang Zhu. So thank you very much. Uh-oh. Looks like I did something bad. <coughs> okay. Yes. 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 Okay, so are you plotting uh, Rxy? And That's where is the mod phase? As a function of density. And, and where is the mod uh, phase? So it's here. So half filling is where the mod, mod transition is, is in this region, mod or whatever it is. So you start with, with one sign. Uh, look at this curve, for example. You start with one sign, which is whole carriers near the edge of the band. And by the time you end up at the end of the mini band, you've change to electron carriers as you must, as you go through a band. So that's a band uh, transition. 
Right. That's, that's a bad, so this is the band transition, right here, the, the Lifshitz transition. And these two additional crossings are caused by the Mott transition. You said it agrees with the theory, which? So the place where this transition happens, that Lifshitz transition, is captured by single particle band theory as a function of electric field. So as you apply electric field, this point moves further and further towards uh, fulfilling. And the two and the peaks, the two peaks. How do they agree with theory? They don't agree with theory at all. So ah, okay. this single particle theory doesn't capture that at all. So okay. We don't. Very interesting. That's that's the that's yeah. We don't understand the whole effect there. Uh, yes. The piezoelectric data that you showed, yes. which was really beautiful, raises the question: uh, if you if you uh, look at the transmission of uh, surface acoustic waves, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, Van der Waals material, do you expect to see uh, be able to learn something about the response in the way you know, people uh, studied quantum hole systems and others? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good idea. We actually haven't thought of that. I don't know about the experimental details of that, whether uh, you would be able to do it with this system. I haven't seen any actual experiments for, uh, uh, I, I wonder whether you might be dominated by substrate effects or things like that. But I'll, I'll think more about that. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You would have thought that the communication between the two, two layers is very weak in WSE2. Weaker than graphene, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But still, you get roughly the same scale. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting that the TC, you know, if you imagine electron phonon coupling, everything is different. So the phonons are different, the couplings are different, everything is different. And why would TC be anywhere in the same ballpark would be strange. Uh, okay. We wrote this and the referee trashed it so badly that I think we'll have to take this out. So, but I agree. It's, it's just an interesting observation that... It points out that phonons are not playing major role. You said that, not me. <laughs> so maybe you already said this, but how do you measure your, your density? The N sub S is high temperature Hall effect or something? or So we do magnetotransport, and at uh, high field, you can see the Landau levels. And so you can see where the Landau levels emerge from at the valence band edge and the Moray edge. And so that gives us a calibration independent of everything. So that's, yeah. Second. Uh, 